Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. And a good morning to you. And I do mean you. Yes. <laughs> well, here we are. It is another morning in Pittsburgh, another gray one. And uh, it's Tuesday, the 5th of February. And uh, it's time to say hi to my sister. Hello, my sister. Good morning, my sister. <laughs> Uh, it is my understanding that you can only stay for two thirds of the program. Uh, that's true. Okay. I apologize. No, but, there's no uh, apology necessary. We so yes, Ubla D. Okay. Well, all kinds of things to talk about. I don't even know where to begin. Guess what? You know, I'm always making fun of the oldest person in the world thing. Well, I, me too. And uh, if you recall, I said it was bad luck to be named the oldest person in the world. Did another one go on? No, but there's a nice picture of the soon-to-be next dead one um, in, in the paper. And it turns out she's from Pittsburgh. She, uh, yeah, she, she's so cute. She's 113. She counts every day a blessing. Elsie Thompson. And uh, she is... Yeah, she's the oldest American, and I think she places fifth in the world. I've lost all the the stats, but um, yeah, she's she's right up there. But uh, well, if she's only fifth in the world, she doesn't have to worry yet. That's not true. I mean, because she's the. I think what we've been looking at are the Americans. Um, I think, haven't we? No. No. I don't okay. Think so. Okay. Here's here's what it is. Uh, she uh, is. Uh, she ascended to become the oldest living American after the death, January twenty third, of uh, Mamie Reardon, who was one hundred fourteen, and uh, so this means that Mrs. Thompson, who we got right here, is the uh, the fifth oldest person in the world, the oldest American, the oldest person in the world is. Um, just 115. They're all sort of the same age, all these people, right? right? And that's a guy right. who lives in Japan. Anyway, right. she was she was born, <coughs> excuse me, in Beaver Falls and uh, grew up in East Liberty, which is uh, right about where I live, Suze. <clears throat> and she was married to a um, Republican state legislator from uh, Mount Lebanon. That's just for, I mean, you don't know these place names, but that's what no, I'm well, telling you. Well, I do, you, uh, sort of, but in some the, of them. I, I'm sure that was back <clears throat> when they were honorable people. Oh, you know, that's what I thought, too. I thought, oh, damn, she was married to a Republican legislator. And then I thought, well, back then, Republicans were <laughs> like <Democrats>. honorable people. <laughs> right. She was born in 1899. So, I mean, you know, she's, Wow. So, anyway, she's a cutie. She, they have a picture of her sitting in front of a Christmas tree, and she looks pretty damn cute. Okay, I just wanted to note that. <clears throat> wrestling papers. What's next? What's I'm next? sorry, I'm sorry. What's next? Uh, the story I really love, I mean, am fascinated by, is the exhumation of... King oh, Richard oh, III. Isn't that fun? Well, fun's not quite the word I was going to apply, but yeah, isn't it fascinating? And how amazing that, what, 600 years later, 500 years later, somebody just using the historical record says, I think this guy is right down there, right beneath this parking space. Right. Well, the, actually, the woman, you know, that spearheaded the whole thing says that she, that she had a feeling all along that that's where, I mean, she literally felt it. And when they found him there, she was vaguely freaked because it was right on the spot that she yeah. had got this feeling. And it, she has this weird thing for him, I think. Yeah, I think she does, too. There's a little kinky thing going on there. So anyway... 
I mean, it's so clearly when they saw the the skeleton that it, it was him because of the curvature of the spine. But then the DNA stuff absolutely works and out. The carbon dating. I mean, everything. <clears throat> everything. Just it's lines him. Lines right up. It's him. And um, the wounds, you know, everything. Right. So it's fascinating, though, that the only thing like we really, any of us know of Richard III, assuming that we, you know, took a Shakespeare class or something, is Shakespeare's um, tragedy. It's not a tragedy. Is that considered a tragedy or just one of the Yeah, that's one of the tragedies. Well, no, no, it's, it's not a tragedy. It's one of the history. Yeah, it's a history. Um, and he just is the most horrible... <laughs> horrible person imaginable and um they this allows for some you know rethinking of him on a historical and political level and the fact that he was killed by the people who then ascended to the throne uh the The sweet tutors the tutors (laughs) right so he w- he he's killed, and then Henry the Seventh. I mean, yeah, the the uh, seventh, right, <clears throat> comes in, right? Yeah. And that's Henry the Eighth's dad, is it not? Right, right. So just a little while later, we're into Henry the Eighth and the Tudors and all of that. But so the so Henry the Fifth and Henry the Sixth were before him. Well, they'd have to have been. Yeah. Look, I don't know my. I, if 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 I were on Jeopardy, this is why I, you know I have this ongoing fantasy that I'd actually get on Jeopardy, and then there'd be subjects and then like this would be a category. And yeah, and dead. I don't I don't have a don't know at all don't know at all. But um, it says here in the Washington Post piece that uh, experts say that most of what is known about. Uh, King Richard III is is really largely propaganda that uh, was put out by the Tudors. By the guess who Tudors? That it, which is a classic thing of you know history is written by the by the winners. So there's a lot of and they and they didn't want his body found. <coughs> you know, I mean the whole thing. They were they were replacing a whole rule. Well, it's interesting that the end of a king would be in such a humiliating manner, where he's stripped, where he's literally tossed into this this grave. And when they found him, the grave was really too short for him, and so he his body couldn't lie flat out, and so his head was like propped up. Um, and he didn't have feet. They must have taken his feet off. He was really, um, you know, whatever. Humiliated, they say. But I don't know if you can be humiliated if you're dead. Can you? Well, desecrated would be more. Desecrated would be the word then. Right. And they've just come out with, you know, they took the skull and figured out what he would look like. And amazingly, he looks like the few portraits that are available of him, except that he's got a, a slightly rounder face and a more pleasant face. <laughs> and the other thing about the height, him well, not fitting... Well, I mean, you know, the computer doesn't decide to make him look like a villain. Well, that's true. The The, the interesting thing about... Um, oh, never mind. Never mind, because I forgot what I was saying. There's so many interesting things about this. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The fact that he didn't fit in the grave, I thought was in- unusual because I always think of people of that time as being so short. But yeah, but he- you know, how big was the grave? The grave might have been even shorter. No, no, no. He was 5'8", they say, from the skeleton. Even tell- curved over, so he would have been... So he was a tall man for that time because... For the time, yeah. If you've seen, and I suspect you have, because I believe you would have been with me when I saw it, uh, Henry VIII's armor. Right. Um, Henry VIII's armor in the, wherever we saw that, in the Tower of London or the London Museum or whatever. Well, you, the last time I saw it, honestly, was in New York at the Metropolitan Museum. Oh, well, I didn't, 
but what you marvel at when you see, or when you see even what, you know, the, the here, this, this was the armor worn by King, this and that, and it looks like little toy stuff. These people were tiny. And his, his was very round. It was very and round and short. It looked like a bean can placed. Yeah. Uh, strategically to uh, give his manhood its own separate... Oh, really? I didn't notice that. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Well, the, the one at, at, at MoMA is hysterical. Because it's it has funny. a... It, it really, it's just funny. It Looks had like a, a, sp- a... Heinz bean can. <laughs> that his penis would fit into? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that nice? So... I, I just think, you know, for somebody we don't know except for the, the this horrible person in Richard the Third, Shakespeare, who would have uh, only known of him the propaganda that he had learned, right? Because he was born, when was Shakespeare born? Born and raised uh, once the Tudors were already in place, right? Right, right. He was, <laughs> he was during, he was, he was an adult during Elizabeth. That's right. Um, interestingly, so, you know, some people wanted him reburied, <coughs> excuse me, reburied at Westminster. And, um, here is a quote from the chairman of the Richard III Society. Uh, we understand the queen has suggested that she doesn't want him there. Isn't that fascinating? So Queen yeah, Elizabeth to I this mean, day... Some, some feuds die hard. Yeah, she doesn't want him there. Wait, we got a call. <laughs> they, they hung up. They did? They did. Well, that was quick, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so the Queen, apparently Buckingham Palace vetoed uh, his being reinterred. Once uh, an enemy of the family, always an enemy Well, if of you the think family. about it, I mean... It, uh, the Tudors, well, she's not a Tudor, but I guess, yeah, she doesn't want him there with her people. Interesting. Interesting. It's so yeah, funny. She's a Windsor. Yeah, it's so funny, though, the way it's, it's worded. We understand the Queen has suggested <laughs> that this is all very sort of, you know, Look, Can't it's a pick- windfall for the little cathedral that he's going to... Yeah. At, you know, they're going to get their very own tourist attraction and, oh, a pretty, and a pretty famous king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to be very interesting, and people are going to go and see it, and they're going to make money, so it's okay. Everything's fine. I mean, I don't know anything about the guy, actually, but I just think it's so mind-blowing that they dug him up and found him, and, and that, yeah, he was a hunchback, although it suggests... Didn't in in um, Richard the uh, Third the Shakespeare play? Didn't it wasn't a he also supposedly had like this sort of withered arm, mm-hmm. withered arm. They and made a, him more monstrous. More monstrous, but you know the skeleton does not show a withered arm. Well, that's just the repre- you know the representation that the deformed body is is emblematic of the deformed depraved mind. Right. He was only king for like two years, and he, and he was... He was uh, young. I was 32. 32 when he was killed. My... Uh, no. A horse. <laughs> a horse. My kingdom for a horse. But it, there he is, the real guy. And fascinating. Fascinating. Okay, now to something a little more current. Another dead king. This would be the king of Cambodia, Noridam Sihanouk. This guy was king all through my life. I mean, I, I yeah. was, stu- yeah. Noridam Sihanouk, uh, king of uh, Cambodia. And uh, he was finally cremated yesterday. And I was sort of blown away by the fact that he Haven't was. Haven't he been dead for like a long time? Oh, yeah. That's what freaked me out. I thought. Well, that's what I was waiting to hear where where this was going because this doesn't make any sense. I know, not to our heads, but it it is real. It he was cremated yesterday. He died uh, October fifteenth. So, 
King Sihanouk's been lying around for what over three months, four months, right. and uh, obviously he's not Jewish because uh, Jews wouldn't leave. That him. wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Jews are Jews are appalled by such things. Leaving a dead body, just he was lying in state for three months, and uh, they finally uh, put him to the torch uh, yesterday. So there you have it, Ken, King Sihanouk. Uh, I also have one other little item that I want to. I I, I read this and thought. Oh, gosh. See, now this shows how bad my geography is. This is another thing. If I were on Jeopardy ever, 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 and, and geography comes up, I'm dead. But listen to this little tiny item and listen to what it tells us about the interconnectedness of all people on this little planet. Okay? Okay. Dateline Hong Kong. Okay? Okay. Every time I give a place name, imagine it in your head. Hong Kong. A French-owned oil tanker that went missing off the Ivory Coast is believed to have been hijacked by pirates. The seizure of the tanker, registered in Luxembourg, likely took place Sunday, said Noel Chung a spokesman for the International Maritime Bureau based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He, tried, he said the seizure was blah, 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 recent attacks by pirates operating in the Gulf of Guinea. Do you realize all those places? And could you, if given a map? No. You could do France. You might get Luxembourg. I'm, I'm a whiz at Italy. <laughs> you could get Hong Kong, maybe? I don't know. And Kuala Lumpur, fat chance. Uh, Gulf of Guinea, uh, no. I- Ivory Coast. Um, isn't that weird, though? Yeah. I don't know. There's just something about all those different, in that one little story about uh, a seas tanker. Well, there you have it. I'm rustling papers again. I'm going to take a break. Okay? Okay. And then we'll come back and talk about some other stuff. There is a lot of stuff in the news. Um, A ton of stuff. Yeah. If anything's really floating your boat, feel free to throw it out yourself there, Suze. Okay, we'll be back. Just a minute. More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. Go to BarkBargains.com for great deals on meals from your favorite local restaurants, museums, and shows. This week only. Get discounts up to 20% on gift cards to Cracker Barrel. Supplies are limited. BarkBargains.com. Pittsburgh's best bargains. BarkBargains.com. Packers. Vikings. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we make a real difference in the building blocks of life. Children succeed in school. Families gain financial stability. The health of our neighbors improves, and suddenly so do our communities. Real change won't happen without you. Live Live United. United. So give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Sign up today at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. All righty, we are uh, back. Chuck writes, uh, the part of the story I find fascinating, and I'm still unsure of this part of the story, is the DNA testing. Uh, supposedly they found a living descendant of King Richard and the DNA testing proved without a shadow of a doubt that this was, in fact, King Richard. They found two. They yeah. found two. They found um, a woman and uh, this the guy. The woman wants to be, didn't want the publicity, but she did allow them to, you know, take her DNA. And the, the two are descendants. What they trace these two to was not Richard specifically, but to Richard's sister. Right. And that's the same line. I guess they had the same parents. Uh, sister. And, yeah, so, well, that would require, obviously, they just, some genealogists, you know, did that, Right. 
Right. And, um... Well, but, don't you think if you were descended from a king, it would be in your family lore and you might self-identify? Th- one would think so, but they didn't self-identify. Um, Chuck says, regardless, how, how would you like it if someone knocked on your door and said, hey, I think you're the descendant of king so-and-so. Could we uh, swab your mouth? That would be a little bit of a shocker. I know I'm not, no kings in my past. But uh, Chuck also wrote, wouldn't the current day queen be a descendant no i mean because there were these these dynasties and uh richard totally different family right richard was the end of the plantagenet dynasty i don't know if it was considered a dynasty uh and because he was overthrown by the first tudor that'd be this henry guy um and then the tudors got knocked out of the picture by who anybody well, Not really. somehow we get to Windsor. Well, but that then that's just through marriage. There wasn't any, oh, God, see, yeah, we don't know it. We don't. No, I don't know. And I read all of this historical fiction to boot. Yeah, but you, you know what's interesting? Stop and think how, you know, we don't know our own history, American history, very well. But imagine if you were, you know, a British uh, kid having to learn their history because their history goes back so much farther than ours. What and we don't have all that much to learn in American history compared to what they'd have to slog through. I mean, going back to way before. I mean, if you were to take that uh, that throne back to the beginning, I don't know who was considered the first king of anything that was resembling England. Do you know? I don't. We don't know. No. Well, we don't know. And there you have it. That, no, I don't know. And I, well, you know. So anyway, the current guy, the guy that did happily step forward, was interesting, that was a descendant. His last name is Ibsen, like the Like the uh, author, like well, the playwright. Like the playwright. Wasn't he Norwegian? Yeah, but, I mean, there's been a lot of family marriages since then. Yeah, and he um, he was there's born... There's 17-something, re- 17 generations removed yeah, or something? Yeah, he was born in Canada, but now he's, a, I think, a furniture maker in, in uh, London. And uh, he's loving this. It's just that no one is recognized. No one well, is recognized. Well, I mean, you asked the question, how would you feel if someone came to your door? I would, I, I think it would be neat. Exciting. Yeah, but apparently yeah. whoever the woman is who was related didn't think so. She really said, no, I mean, I'll let you do it, but I don't want anyone to know who I am. In a, well, in but a, that I think is because she didn't want, you know, uh, what, you know, the tabloid reporters on her front lawn. Yeah. No, I can't imagine that anybody really would. No, um, right. Okay. Uh, something else. This was uh, in the New York Times today, a science section, and this is interesting and a bit depressing, I would think. It says, researchers have been searching, well, that is what researchers do. Oh, by the way, Jess said that she looked online and there's no, um, no one is, uh, there's no historical uh, consensus on who the first king of the British Isles or England is, was. I mean, it was such a constant, I mean, there were different, who the hell I mean, uh, not William the Conqueror? (laughs) Oh, I think it goes way back before that. Well, Well, yeah, it does. William the Conqueror, was he, okay, what's the oldest king you can come up with that you know anything about? Was it the Magna Carta guy? And when was that? Who's Egbert? Egbert. See, now, if you were in Egbert's, I mean, well, these it's are... Well, has got to be, a, I mean, the Magna Carta, you know, you just have to decide when it is that the entity that you're talking about comes into existence. Well, I don't know, but... Well... Wasn't there a big battle uh, in 10-something? 10 <laughs> 1066? Yeah, right, the Battle of... Uh, I want to say Hastings, but I'm sure that's not right. No, the Battle of, come 
that? Isn't there anybody out there who knows some English history? Yeah, would none of us would do any good on Jeopardy. Jeez, we'd embarrass ourselves totally. No, we we no, we would we would uh, we we'd study up. Oh well, no, but I mean, there'd be so many things to study up, you wouldn't know where to start. Seriously. Anyway, uh, researchers. I think I interrupted myself before. I know. I used to know more about this, but it's been filed away someplace where I can no longer access it. Right. So researchers have been searching for ways to uh, explain why there are so many more men in science uh, professions and who major in it than women. And you Yeah, know, it turns out only in the United States. Pretty much that's true. So here's, this is fascinating. Um... A test given in 65 countries uh, by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development finds that among 15-year-old girls and boys all around the world, girls actually generally outperform the boys in science, but not in the United States. All right, so yeah. so it's cultural. It's totally cultural. Jesus. And 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 by the way, it's not just the United States. I think there's um I think there are two other countries and it might be the other it might be Canada and uh it might be England, I think. Uh let me get this straight. Yeah, well, uh, it's countries that, you know, might as well be right. the United States. <clears throat> that's, <clears throat> that's right. That are culturally very similar. Oh, okay, that's right. Researchers say these cultural forces are strongest in the United States, Britain, and Canada. But you don't see them in Russia. You don't see them in Asia. You don't see it anywhere. I mean, in, even in the Middle East, in Jordan, for example, girls score more than 8% better in science than boys do. In Albania, the same. In Qatar, the same. So that's, that's weird because you think of, I don't know if it's Qatar or Qatar, but Qatar and Jordan, I mean, we think of these as, you know, these are cultures that really keep women down. But apparently they don't screw around with their heads about, you know... Well, they keep them man. down in all respects, but once they open up the doors, there's no cultural thing saying that you, can't, you can do this better than that because they were told they couldn't do anything. So now they can do everything. Yeah. So what they're saying is that it is cultural, it's a stereotype threat that somehow... Uh, one of the co-authors of the report say, we see that very early in childhood, around the age of four, gender roles in occupations are formed. So, whatever, by four, most of us girls have gotten the message. We've gotten it from, you know, all kinds of possible sources, but we've gotten it. Loudly and clearly. And I think another thing that I just noticed, I mean, anecdotally and with my own coming of age, is I think that when I know I started just becoming a blithering idiot in math and science coincided exactly with puberty. And again, I think that the cultural pressure was that a budding young lady uh, would not, you know, necessarily be into science and math. Do you think? Who knows? Right, right. I mean, I, I know that we, I mean, and I have the same thing. Sad. I, and, and it doesn't even make sense because I am by temperament extremely yeah. mechanically. Right. You oriented. should have been, yeah, in science and math. And I should have been. But you and, got... and Science should have been se second nature to me, and instead, the static would turn on. 
That's right. It is. It's like all of a sudden... And I be- did it for math, too. Right. You become a blithering idiot. You don't understand and, anything. And when I was a little girl, my favorite thing in the whole world to do was do long division problems. That was right up there with diagramming sentences. Those are two things I like doing, too. I did, too. Diagramming sen- I once diagrammed... Did you ever do it? The preamble Play to the Lou Constitution. To the at Washington Junior High School. Was that ever cool? The friggin' preamble, which goes on forever. Diagram that. <laughs> what fun. <laughs> it was so satisfying to make all those little lines and draw them with your ruler and and I bet they don't even, the language. I bet I they don't even loved it. I bet they don't even teach that anymore. No, and that's why you get, you know, writing looking like the writing you get. Well, um Oh, speaking of uh, 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 of teaching too, didn't, I think I had something I wanted to ask you about. Oh, darn it, darn it! What was it about schools? Oh, this we brought this up yesterday, or not? Uh, that that this core curriculum that forty five states sign on to, um, general guidelines about what you would teach in you know at every level in public schooling. Um, they are now for the first time saying that. Uh, handwriting should not be um, a priority. And no, handwriting is uh, out. So out. they say now, here's a, what they say, is that by grade four, uh, a student must be adept at keyboarding. Keyboarding. <laughs> that is... We what, audited, I mean, this, is, this isn't new. No. I mean, the fact that well, it's finally made itself into the core curriculum is amazing it, that it took this long because keyboarding has been part of yeah. uh, the district, uh, the school district well, yeah. that uh, we live in. Keyboarding well, has been part of the curriculum for the last uh, 25 years. Well, it must be here, too, because I know my son learned it in, in grade school and uh, in the public school system here. and you know, But it shouldn't. I mean, you know, just like... Just like calculators shouldn't mean that you can't add in your own head. But it does end up... The, the existence of a keyboard does, shouldn't mean that you don't know how to manipulate a, a writing implement and create a letter on your own. Yeah, but who's going to teach you that? Because now they're saying, we can't do it all. You can't do it no, all. They can't. So we're not doing that now. I mean, there may be, there'll be a class. If kids are interested, they can take it. Well, actually, can I say something? Yes, they can, too, do it all. Stop trying to squeeze it into a an artificially short day that is shorter than an artificially short school year that is shorter than every other country that does better than us. And and when we have proven statistics that show that those long summer vacations, the kids just evaporate. Half of what they learned the year before for a large number of kids disappears and you have to spend time redoing that at the beginning of the year. It makes for a net loss of available time to learn and digest and keep new material. And we fall farther and farther behind while every other place is keeping their kids in longer, and they, and they do better. I mean, it's not, it's, it, it just works better. It, it, it's how learning occurs, and it reflects it more accurately. Well, maybe we'll get around to that sometime later. Well, and the other thing that, you know, got me going was sitting I was listening to uh, uh, the news hour on, on PBS last night, and they do this long, rhapsodizing piece about uh, this school district that's doing things differently. And, and, and the way they evaluate teachers is totally different, and the way they they reward their teachers is based on merit, and no one's ever done such a thing before, and this is how it's done. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's what we've been doing for 30 years at, at the school district that I had it up. Well, and that's what they just threw out. They just threw... It makes me sick, because it is the right way to do it, mm-hmm. and it is the right way to nurture and support and get the highest quality teachers is to have meaningful interactions with, you know, with like an actor and a director. 
You're, you get meaningful feedback, which you then incorporate. You don't get punished for doing things badly. You get rewarded for doing things well. Duh. Carrots and not sticks. Well, I know Susan gets very passionate about these educational issues. It's because people like these highfalutin, you know, faddish ideas of what's the best thing. And it turns out, duh, the best thing is a well-educated, talented teacher in the front of the class. Period. Boom. Done. Not necessarily a teacher who's gone, who's majored in education, or just who's good at the subject. What about that issue? It has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with a lot of other things, with the talent of being a good teacher. You could know, you could have a Ph.D. in the subject and not know how to impart the knowledge. You could have a Ph.D. in education and not be a charismatic teacher that connects with the students. It's a talent. You need all of those things. Yeah, well... And there's plenty of people out there like that, and they should be recognized. Okay. We got a call. Hello there. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, you're talking about education. I hate to change the subject, but they need to do something about this property tax. <laughs> they need to change the flat tax somehow. My kids are raised. My kids have kids. Why do I got to pay for somebody else's kids to go to school? I mean, because I don't mind doing it while my kids are going to school, but they need to change the whole thing. There's, there's other ways to get that money. How it got involved in people's homes that have paid for, and they're losing their homes down here in Beaver County over sheriff's cells, and the home's been paid off for years. The elderly people lose their homes. They need to change that property tax to something that's more everybody pays their fair share. That's my opinion. Okay. We'll see you. Thank you. So uh, I just want to say that, I mean, we all, whether you have children or not, it makes sense from a just a... a commu- what's good for the community. What's good for the community, that we all care about the education of the children, the children who will... Um, you know, be our doctors, our nurses, our our bus drivers, our this. You know, it, it benefits all to have obviously an education. Well, and when but your children, right. you aren't your property taxes did not pay anywhere near what it costs to educate your children. But it's I just want to say, deal. tying. I agree with him that t- it takes the community to support your child, and then your job is to support other people's children yeah. when they've gotten done supporting yours. I understand, but. Here's the thing. I do agree with him that funding education... It is not an efficient system, but I... But through my, a property tax be, is not a good amount, idea. That if not more of dollars, is going to be taxed to you and come out of somewhere. Here's why... So pro- can, Susan, here's why property taxes are not a good way to fund education. Because, because they fund it unequally. Yeah, because wealthy communities then have wealthy schools, and poor communities where you actually need the better schools... Have lousy schools. But what kind example, of stupidity in is that? Where where I pay all of my property taxes, I do not. My district gets absolutely zilcho money from the state. Yeah, well, join the crowd. Nobody gets anything from our state anymore. Well, and but in poorer districts, to equalize, you see, I mean, we equalize by by giving state money to districts with with that oh cannot raise Oh my it. god, your your state does that, my Missouri. My state does that. You it's mean the they education do formula. You mean it's never so they fully funded. Okay, but, but they that's do something what it's right. There for. Okay, well, in Pennsylvania as far as I can ascertain, our state seems to give more money to rich districts and screws the hell out of the poor ones. It is beyond comprehension. Yeah, well, right. It is beyond comprehension. And that's when they're not taking money away from all of public education and giving it to who the hell knows. Some, uh, I maybe Exxon Mobil for drilling someplace somewhere so they don't have to pay any taxes. Don't get me started. Oh, no, and you know, you got me so revved up I looked at the clock and you I had to go. To I know. Off. Goodbye. Thank bye. you, Suze. Bye. See you next week. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, no, I, now I'm all worked up. Caller, you got me worked up because nothing upsets me more 
than the way we fund public education. It is almost as if we came up with this ingenious system that keeps the have-nots down, actually pushes them further down. You think you're a have-not? Wait till we see what we do to your children. <laughs> and takes wealthy communities <clears throat> and makes sure that their children continue to pull away, pull away, pull away. The schools with all the bells and whistles and wonderful programs of support, they need to be in the poor sections. Your education should not be contingent. The quality of your education should not be contingent on your friggin' zip code and on where your parents happen to be able to live. It's disgusting. It drives me mad. Truly drives me mad. Okay, I have to tell you I have a very funny thing to report, and amazingly, it's a funny thing that came out of the mouth of a guy who I never think of as funny in at at not even if he were trying. And that would be our current Secretary of State, John Kerry, right? He doesn't strike you as like a ha, ha, ha funny guy, does he? No. But John Kerry, on his first day as Secretary of State, <clears throat> told um, the, I was going to call it Foggy Bottom, but where'd that come from? Calling the State Department Foggy Bottom. <laughs> if anyone knows the derivation of that, let me know. Um, okay, so John Kerry alluding to the fact that there has not been a male Secretary of State for four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight. it'd have to be 12 years, right? Condoleezza Rice, eight. Oh, wait, Madeleine Albright was before Condoleezza. It's been like what? How long has it been? Eight, 16, uh, eight, 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 eight. it might be 20 years since we've had, um, was Colin Powell the last male Secretary of State? Yes, Jess? No. He was. Wow. Amazing. So th this is a position that the women have owned for a long time. So Carrie coming in yesterday did say, and I, I love it because the image is so funny. He told the folks at the State Department well, I'm fully aware that I have some big high heels to fill. <laughs> That's good, huh? That's good. Okay. Final break, and uh, I'll be back. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we've got a pep talk that can motivate you. Sometimes things don't always turn out the way you want them to. You can improve your future. Now get your game face on and take the first step towards a better life. Hurry up. Don't make me repeat myself. Whatever level of motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Call 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or visit yourged.org for your pep talk and for free classes in your area. GED is a registered trademark of the American Council on Education. Brought to you by Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Pittsburgh City Paper is available now. Pick up one today for John Waters at the Warhol. Plus, Hot Wire Music, Radio Tokyo, The Lumineers, and News of the Weird. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout Western Pennsylvania. And on the web at pghcitypaper.com. And on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Oh, Lordy. All right, Raymond. He writes, don't mourn handwriting becoming old news. Keep your eye open for a keyboard layout revolution. QWERTY, Q-U-E-R-T-Y, maybe a thing of the past. We have a caller? Okay. Hello there. Hello, Lynn. Yes, sir. Lynn, uh, just to get you straightened here, it's not Froggy Bottom, it's Foggy Bottom. No, that's what I said, Foggy Bottom. <laughs> I didn't oh, okay. Say well, anyway, Foggy Bottom is one of the oldest neighborhoods 
in uh, DC, Washington D.C. Oh, and that's because it was along the riverside, I guess. Well, thank so you. That's all I know. Well, thank you. And there might have been frogs in that misty, uh, moist. Heaven knows, even tadpoles. Indeed. Well, I guess where there's one, there may be the other, but I thank you. You bet. Well, I'm sure if there weren't then, there certainly are now with yeah. all those senators hanging around. Okay. <laughs> thank okay, you. Kate, take care. Yeah, you too. Bye. Yeah, Foggy Bottom. I didn't say Froggy. Anyway, Ray writes, our kids are going to have many multiple choices in keyboards. What is evaporating isn't one thing or another. What is evaporating is standardized anything. Choices upon choices until we're paralyzed by the choices that the marketplace provides. Well, I've, I've often told the story of watching this, um, taking a man who had lived in Russia the Soviet Union. He lived in the Soviet Union all his life. And this would have been in the early 80s when Gorbachev was in and Glasnost and Perestroika. Remember those words, guys? And uh, the Soviet Union was opening up, but it was still the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden, they were allowing some of their citizens to travel abroad. And he had come to reunite with a sister that he hadn't seen since before World War II. And as a reporter, I went to cover this happy reunion. And, and, and then I had the bright idea of showing this poor Soviet the wonderful capitalist marketplace that exists where his sister had happily lived and that he had been denied by communism. So I took him to a giant eagle. And, you know, with a camera in tow. And this man, I'll never forget it. He walked in. We, the first thing we saw was the produce. We walked in and we were in the produce area. And he looked like he had walked into something that, you know, I guess was like the Garden of Eden. He could not believe. This was when... In the Soviet Union, people were standing in line for, you know, for hours and hours to maybe get one apple or uh, six ounces of meat. And so to see all this bounty, I, I couldn't quite read his face and he couldn't speak English. So we, and mostly I was just observing him. But we, I remember we went from the produce, the, the, the thing where we turned into a regular aisle. And my memory is that it was cereal. It might have been, who knows, something else. But he looked, and then he looked, and he had a look on his face I, that I characterized as anger, but also looked like just sort of sensory overload, where he couldn't even process it anymore, could not process what he was seeing. But that was the first time that I saw the bounty of the American marketplace, the choices of the American marketplace through the eyes of someone who had never seen such a thing. And it was the first time that I had a set. I remember I felt shame. Maybe that wasn't the right thing to feel. Leave it to a bleeding heart liberal to feel it. I felt guilty. I felt, I, for the first time, I looked at all the bounty that we take for granted, and all I saw was wretched excess <laughs> and more than our share or something. I was just, I was so mortified, and it was so clear he wanted out. He did not want to be in that place, and we did. We, we, we got out. I still have some gifts he gave me. Pack of Russian so Soviet cigarettes, a little pin of Vladimir Lenin. Lenin. <laughs> he gave me a little Lenin pin. It's red, and there's Lenin's face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But, uh, you know, so somewhere in between the, 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 the deprivation, excuse me, 
of his homeland and the wretched excess of my homeland is probably where ideally humanity would be, I think. But So, yeah, the marketplace, and, and Ray suggests, will be paralyzed by choice. I think we already are paralyzed by choice. Um, I needed a new tube of toothpaste the other day, and I told myself, you're going and you are not going to stand for more than 10 seconds <clears throat> in front of the toothpaste. <laughs> you're going to just grab one. You're not going to think, hmm, do I want the whitening one? Do I want the tartar fighting one? Do I want the scope one? Do I want the complete one? They say there's a complete one. Do I want the sensitive one? Do I want the this? Do I want the flavor? Do I want the da 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 Do I want it to stand up? Do I want it to lie down? Do I want it to squirt? Do I want it to... Ah! I just want some toothpaste! <laughs> So I, I did that. I just grabbed, I grabbed one. Jesus, what nonsense. Anyway, am I screaming a lot today? I believe I am. Um, got an awful lot to talk to you about, but I'm going to have to, hmm. I read something in the Wall Street Journal this weekend that I really want to read to you. I was moved by it. It's written by a guy who was an Eagle Scout, who I guess you are once an Eagle Scout, always an Eagle Scout. And this is, um, this of course is germane because um, I believe as I speak, the board of the Boy Scouts is wrestling, hashing out they're exactly what they're going to do uh, in regard to uh, perhaps, well, you know, allowing gays in, okay? Um, and this guy, his name is Nick Gillespie. He wrote something that I just thought was, I don't know, wonderful. Can I read it to you? The Boy Scouts of America are in the news again for the only thing they ever seem to be in the news for anymore, their attitudes toward homosexuals. Next week, the Scouts will hold a vote that's widely expected to end the blanket ban on gays joining as members or holding adult leadership. By most accounts, the century-old organization will probably let individual chartering groups, many of which are churches, decide whether homosexuals can join and help run their troops. Before I get to whether that's a good idea, let me share some of the lessons I learned while working toward the rank of Eagle Scout, which I earned in 1980. Many were trivial, others profound. Most have stayed with me. I learned how to show up on time, or better yet, 10 minutes early. I learned how to dress carefully and distinctly, how to roll and secure my troop signature pale blue neckerchief in exactly the prescribed manner, how to shine my shoes and how to cinch my belt so that the metal-clad tips met brass on brass. I learned that wearing a uniform didn't mean you all had to think the same way. I learned how to stand straight and not laugh inappropriately and how to tie not just a bowline knot but a sheep shank too. I learned that woodworking and carving were hard but like any other skill, if you practiced it long enough, you could get pretty good at it. For one of my 20-plus merit badges, I learned that I could survive in the woods overnight with nothing but a length of rope, a pound of ground beef, a pocket knife, and a flint and steel for starting a fire. I learned the incredible rush that comes from starting a fire with nothing but a hunk of rock and a piece of metal when you're cold and hungry and wondering what the heck you were doing outside with nothing to eat except a pound of ground beef. I learned I could swim a mile in a lake without touching the bottom once and that I could use a compass to find my way through the woods. I learned that one of the best ways to deal with a troublemaker was to give him a little responsibility. I was a troublemaker. 
I learned that I could talk to my father about sleeping outdoors in a tent, as he had done as an infantryman in World War II. I learned that men who weren't your dad, but had fought in Korea and Vietnam and worked jobs that weren't glamorous or even personally rewarding, could teach you a lot and could be great fun. I learned about, how, about trust and confidence and leadership when I was asked to instruct tenderfoot scouts on how to use axes and hatches safe, hatchets safely, build fires without burning down the forest, and shine their shoes and roll their neckerchiefs properly and stand at attention without laughing inappropriately. I learned that not everything and everyone had to be ironic or cynical or jaded all the time, and that some of the goofiest, most earnest traditions and rituals circling up for taps at the end of each weekly meeting, say, or reciting the scout law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, held enormous power. I learned that the scout motto, be prepared, and slogan, do a good turn daily, were pretty good ideas to take seriously throughout life. During hundreds of camping trips and meetings and service projects and weird and wonderful events, such as the Klondike Derby, which was a cold weather competition in which scouts drag makeshift sh sleds over frozen ground for hours, I learned how to adapt to changing circumstances on the fly while keeping the main goal in sight. Now, of course, it's time for the Boy Scouts themselves to learn a lesson about adaptability, one that I fear may be coming too late to save the group from its long decline in numbers and influence. I still draw on what I learned in the Scouts, whose mission statement talks about preparing young people to make ethical and moral choices over their lifetimes. That creed has helped to make me a better father, or at least a less bad one, to my two sons, whom I kept from joining the Boy Scouts because of the group's position on gays. It was a decision that I made with much sadness and not a little anger, but it was fully in keeping with that scout oath, which requires members to do their best to be, this is ironic, morally straight at all times and to do what they think is right. I hope that by the time my sons become fathers, they will feel comfortable enrolling their own children in the scouts, and I will be able to talk with my grandkids about what it's like to sleep in a tent outdoors and to pull a sled over frozen ground, and how to stand at attention without laughing inappropriately, and all the rest. I love that because I know that there is much uh, that is so good in the Scouts, and how their stupidity and bigotry on this one issue has kept all that positive stuff from a lot of kids, including my son, because I would not allow him to join, too, much like this guy. And I wasn't an Eagle Scout. This guy really must have struggled because for him it was such a positive experience. But I, I would not let my son join an organization that would teach him that it was okay to discriminate. And, and yet, he was denied all the wonderful things that scouting, I guess, can give to people. But I found that a very, it, 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 it hurt my heart. It's so, so unnecessary, this craziness. And who knows what the, and, and, and I think he's right, that whatever the scouts do, it's going to be too late in many respects. And that I think all you'll see pretty much is, is scouting is now already uh, so intertwined with, uh, with churches and I'm truly the Catholic Church as well that I just, I, again, until these institutions get over their homophobia, they are going to be prevented from teaching the good stuff that they have to teach to another generation. 
Okay, so that Kiss uh, thing, the the commercial that drove me crazy, uh, the GoDaddy commercial with the blonde supermodel kissing the geeky guy. Um, the geeky guy has been heard from. Uh, the geeky guy is a 34-year-old. He didn't look 34. Yeah. He's a 34-year-old character actor named Jesse Hyman. All right. It's not spelled the same. I know. It's funny. Jess is laughing. Hyman. Ha! Okay. Um, it's just one of a number of Jewish names that are, like, embarrassing. It's true. Poor guy. I mentioned Schmugger the other day. <laughs> Schmugger. And uh, Hyman. Okay, I can't think of any others at the moment, but there's tons of them, obviously. Okay, so it was, he said, this is so sad because, I mean, he's asked these questions. He, he is single, and he admits to never having had a serious girlfriend. So that's why he was chosen. He looks like somebody who would never get. Anyway, so here's what he says is about that shoot. She kissed amazingly soft and sweet. I'm going to hold all kissers to that standard, and it's going to be hard to beat. It may sound dumb, he says, but the day was exhausting. He lost count, but the kissing scene was reshot as much as 60 times. <laughs> Quote, Jesse, We started kissing in the morning and continued after lunch. <laughs> The ad took nearly six hours to shoot. The director advised me at lunch not to eat anything with garlic. He occasionally had to use mouthwash and lip balm between takes. He said even, it was even worth all the embarrassing auditions that he had gone through. One audition in front of the casting crew involved kissing a plastic blow-up doll that he says was a Lindsay Lohan knockoff. <laughs> <coughs> that was the first cut. You had to kiss this Lindsay Lohan doll. When he was called back for a second audition, he had to kiss an actual woman. Here's a, another quote from Jesse Hyman. He says, it's really weird to stand next to a stranger and someone shouts, action, and you're suddenly <laughs> kissing them. So this is the guy. He's hoping that this will be a springboard to other, other roles. Jesse Hyman, 34, never had a girlfriend. And now in the most hated Super Bowl ad um, of at least this year's entrance. Oh, my God. We're past time. So I got to go. Potter tomorrow. We're going to talk. I, I, I wanted to get into it today. Tomorrow I want to talk to Potter about <clears throat> this uh, a memo that's come out, excuse me, um, from the Obama administration. It somehow got leaked. Michael Isikoff of NBC got his hands on it. And it is a 16-page memo that explains why and how Americans can target other Americans or anybody for that for that matter with a drone attack a deadly drone attack and it's pretty alarming in some respects to read so we'll talk about that targeted drone killing and the Obama administration's uh, memo about why it's okay and it's a memo, believe me, that if it came out of uh, George W.'s White House, I would have understood coming out of Obama's, it's a little disconcerting. So, whatever. Tomorrow, I want to get into that with you, okay? Have a great day. Lynn Cullen Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Cullen Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.